Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Dr. Mohamed Insour. I am the Executive Director of Eastern Mediterranean Public Health Network, MFINIC. I am pleased to welcome all of you today to this important webinar titled COVID-19 and the Health Workforce, Implication for Public Health Capacity. Nowadays, health works has become a major concern at the health policy issue around the world. Health works is the cornerstone for health system and the crucial asset for population health. The Global Health Security Index study indicates that no country is adequately prepared for epidemics or pandemics. It's concluded that international preparedness and readiness is weak. In the era of Sustainable Development Goal, SDGs, ensuring better health and realizing universal health coverage would logically depend on strong national, regional, and global health workforce. There is a positive correlation between the density of the health workforce and population health outcomes. Investment in health workforce through scaling up health employment will lead to economic growth. Recently, COVID-19 has brought more focus on the public health capacity dimension of the health workforce. I would like to thank Professor Amir Salama, the Secretary General for the Association of Arab uh, Universities for his support to coordinate this webinar jointly with Infinite to discuss, to discuss this important and relevant topic to our region and to the world at large. Professor Amir is the former Minister of Higher Education, Scientific Research and Technology in Egypt. He served his country as a member of the upper house of the Parliament of Egypt and he did its housing committee. Professor Salama is the chairman of the board of trustees for the foundation of the Children Cancer Hospital in Egypt. It's our honor and great pleasure to have you with us today, Professor Amr. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohanad. Uh, my name is uh, good. Good, where, wherever you are. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. As we are in a virtual meeting, uh, nobody knows where everyone uh, is situated. Well, uh, let me say uh, that on behalf of myself, of, of my colleagues in the Association of Arab Universities, and myself, of course, we are in the association are very pleased to jointly. Uh, do this uh, webinar together with Infinite. We are in the Association of Arab Universities that realize the importance, the importance of and, and, and significance of the workforce challenge, challenges in our region. This importance has been well highlighted during the current pandemic of COVID-19. To contribute to enriching the discussion and provide practical recommendations to strengthen the health systems, particularly the health workforce, we are organizing this important webinar. It worth to mention that the association is a non-governmental with, with more than 400 Arab universities members at the present time. The association was established in 1964 upon a resolution issued by the Arab League. The mission of the association aims at assisting and coordinating the efforts of Arab universities to prepare capable graduates who can serve their Arab communities and preserve, preserve its unified culture and civilization, as well as to assist in developing its natural resources. It's our pleasure to jointly organize this webinar with Infinite, especially that Infinite contributes to enhancing health status in the region by promoting country capacity in various fields of public health, like workforce capacity, research, rapid response to emergencies, and outreach. Currently, Infinite, Infinite has significant contribution to the management of the current COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar aims to clarify the health workforce gaps and challenges concerning public health competence, provide a review of the current situation, issues and challenges related to the health workforce, and propose 
relevant recommendations to address the gap and challenges. Uh, again, I'm welcoming you, everyone, welcoming the speakers, welcoming all the participants, and uh, I hope that we have a fruitful webinar. And now I'm inviting Dr. Mohammed once again to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Salam. And this is really our honor and the pleasure to have you with us this evening. So uh, I am also delighted to present our first speaker today, Dr. Dr. Fathiya Golengedek. And Dr. Fathiya Golengedek is a physician with postgraduate training in public health and health economics, currently the coordinator in the health workforce development in the World Health Organization Regional Office for the Eastern Mediterranean region. Dr. Gedek started her career in WHO Regional Office for Europe as a regional advisor supporting healthcare reform. She's later under, undertook the responsibility for the healthcare policies and system in Central Asia Republics. Dr. Gedek has a 20 year long journey in areas of health policies and system and the human resources for health at the national and international levels. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you, uh, Dr. Gedek, and her presentation today title is Strengthening the Health Workforce Through a Public Health Approach. What is the role of WHO EMRO? Thank you, uh, and the floor is yours, please. Uh, so you will have 10 minutes, and we will have a uh, follow-up couple of questions that we need. Please, for the audience, please drop your questions in a Q&A that we can later ask the speakers. Please do not hesitate to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohanad. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to colleagues, uh, friends. And it is great pleasure for me uh, to be here today. And I would like to extend my sincere thanks to organizers for kind invitation to this very significant webinar. I say very significant webinar because we are uh, at the start of 2021, which is the international year of, for, of health and care workers, which was designated by the exec, uh, WHO World Health Assembly in uh, October. So, and as far as I know, this is the first webinar on uh, health workforce regionally and also globally. So thank you very much for marking the year. And it is my great pleasure to join this webinar to mark the start of this year. So health workers are at the uh, forefront of the response to COVID-19, and they have showed great efforts this year. They are both service providers, but at the same time, they are uh, at high risk groups for contracting the disease. The experience so far clearly highlighted the role of the different group of health workers. So, Actually, when we talk about COVID response, we are not only talking about doctors, nurses, et cetera. We are talking about different groups of health professionals. We are talking about public health professionals, epidemiologists, et cetera, health management workforce, laboratory professionals, pharmacists, and all the others. So that's, uh, that shows the broad range of interventions required for health workforce uh, to make sure that they effectively respond, respond to COVID-19. So the rapidly increasing workload has resulted in further shortages in health workforce, where shortages was a challenge in our region even before the pandemic. This was exacerbated with the reduction of the number of available health workers due to infection, isolation, or quarantine uh, situation in case of their contact. So mobilizing health workers for COVID-19 response has, been, has taken priority 
but also maintaining essential health services has been another challenge at the same time. In WHO past survey for maintaining essential health services, 49% of the countries referred the shortages of health workers due to redeployment to COVID re response as a challenge in, in maintaining essential health services. So they have to uh, be there, but in, ad in addition to shortages, we faced the new virus and they needed updated knowledge and skills. And health workers are also at the risk of becoming infected, even losing their lives. And they may fear transmitting the infection to their families and the loved ones. So however, there is no available accurate data on healthcare uh, worker infections. Eventually, some studies are coming up with different figures. For example, ICN referred to a range between 2 to 30% of the cases with an average of 10% belong to health workers. So this figure is in line uh, with the figures we get from some countries and from studies which with an average of 4 to 10%. So, and majority of these uh, infections are seen among nurses, which can be attributed to their longer contact with patients. And also these country the results also indicated higher infection rates among female health workers. Healthcare workers also faced a number of stressors with sudden increase in the number of COVID-19 patients Highly stressful working environment with long working hours also have led to psychosocial distress, fatigue, occupational burnout, and sometimes even physical and psychological violence, unfortunately. Fear of infection, being the only one with the patients during their difficult times, social stressors such as stigma, being away from their home, from their children, enhance their stress. And a number of different studies uh, indicate that, indicates that 30 to 50% of health workers reported different levels of psychosocial distress. As we struggle with the shortages, the health professional education was also disrupted. Though most institutions managed to continue online education, challenges remained with clinical and practical training and assessments. And I believe uh, other speakers will talk about these issues in more detail, so I will not uh, spend more time on this. So WHO EMRO developed a, a guidance note at very early stage of the pandemic to guide uh, the response uh, to COVID-19. And the countries have addressed these challenges. Response required mobilizing health workforce mobilize, to address the shortages. WHO developed some tools uh, to estimate the health workforce requirements for COVID-19 response, uh, contract tracing, and other elements. Countries use approaches such as um, reassigning health workers, repurposing them, the existing staff, mobilizing inactive staff uh, like uh, retired ones with some contractual arrangements, uh, also mobilizing uh, students, self-professional education students, volunteers, uh, emergency medical teams, or involving community health workers. However, it has also been clear the need was not only on healthcare, but also the response should have ad should address the public health professionals and other health professionals, as I mentioned in the beginning of my pre presentation. We are now challenged with new requirements as the vaccination is being rolled out in countries. In terms of estimating 
the require health workforce requirements to deliver vaccines, de their deployment and capacity building. Initial ballpark estimations for the health workforce requirements for vaccination imply that especially low income countries may face health workforce shortages in uh, providing the vaccinations in rolling out the vaccination. Mobilizing health workforce has not been sufficient, but we need to make sure that they function effectively and efficiently as the COVID-19 was a new virus and we continue to learn about. Thus, the health workers should have technical guidance, access to new and correct information, especially in the presence of infodemics. And they need to be able to work in an enabling environment with a conducive environment with supplies and etc. The safety of health workers has been also critical. In the beginning, it was critical to ensure uh, personal protective equipment with a training, with an adequate training on the use of them. But also, uh, and uh, generally, the uh, facilities implemented infection prevention and control measures in and aiming at reducing the risk of infection for healthcare workers as well as the patients. So including uh, putting in place surveillance and monitoring mechanisms for infection among health workers. And also some countries introduced some audit mechanisms to regularly check these. Also environmental and managerial components of infection prevention and control are emphasized, such as ventilation and patient flows. During these times, reassigning high-risk workers to lower risk functions, risk functions, flexible working arrangements have been introduced to minimize the contact of the health workers with the uh, infected patients. So in some cases, uh, they arrange the entries and exits to patients and uh, working hours, et cetera. Also, uh, we have seen more and more health workers exhibit signs of stress and fatigue. The, the mental health support was highlighted as an important aspect. Telephone helplines were introduced in uh, many of the countries to serve the health workers who were needing mental health support, but they are reluctant to uh, disclose their problems in their own facilities. Policies uh, and resources were also made available uh, for the compensation of the health workers to acknowledge their uh, contributions. So some uh, incentives were introduced this includes special access to testing, supporting measures during isolation or quarantine, free treatment, uh, compensation in case of severe illness and unfortunate results, as well as incentives to motivate health workers to keep them in the service or availing some leave credits. So also in some countries, introduce some mechanisms to recognize uh, their efforts in different ways in, with awards or other uh, mechanisms. During this period, communication and training have been critical element cross-cutting in all areas. And communication and constant updating of health workforce was one of the ways to reduce uh, their uh, anxiety and uh, keep them uh, updated. And also uh, technologies were used in the uh, context of uh, physical distancing. So online trainings and online communication were the main areas of communication. As we learn from uh, COVID-19, experience, we also know that new normal will be different. 
and health workforce is not an exception. The skill mix will be different. We will need more uh, public health professionals. And we will need health workers with greater knowledge of population health, better understanding of public health principles, better knowledge and understanding of teamwork, un understanding and knowledge of health systems, leadership skills, and ability in engaging with communities. And this will certainly have implications on future health professional education. For health professional education, we need to develop strategies and plans addressing the skill mix issues. The educational approaches will move towards more hybrid online education and curriculum content needs to be adjusted to this new requirements and, uh, encompassing more public health issues, health systems issues. This will also lead changes in the infrastructure, faculty skill mix of the health professional education institutions, and also regulatory bodies needs to re revise and update the regulation and standards to ensure the quality of professional education in the new context. I would like to emphasize, we need to create a resilient health workforce. And I would like to conclude with our motto of the World Patient Safety Day this year. Keep health workers safe, keep patients safe. And I believe this will take us into the year of health and care workers to ensure more commitment, more investment, and more partnerships to address our health workforce challenges and transform our health workforce for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate uh, your clarification and guidance that this is the first webinar at the regional level and maybe at the global level so this is a very good issue to know and uh, i think uh, we need to take this initiative and to to do such similar webinars more and more to to raise the importance and to shed the light toward you know the workforce development and i think this is really uh, with all uh, COVID-19, but I think still this is ignored area and we need to, to bring it up and up. And just if you allow me the uh, for one question, what are the best estimates on the number of the healthcare workers, public health workers infected or died of COVID-19 at the regional level? This is very, very painful uh, story from our region about, you know, how 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 our people were committed or you know how they treated our or the ability to offer ppes and other protective measures so if you allow a few words about this topic thank you thank you very much i wish i wish i could give you a very concrete answer to that since the beginning we are really struggling to get information from countries uh, accurate information about the level of healthcare worker infections. Unfortunately, uh, our information is uh, relatively sporadic. Some countries are uh, putting it into their uh, dashboards, but some countries are not. And uh, it is always um, questionable the quality of this information. But uh, so that's uh, the reason I cannot give a concrete answer. But as I mentioned, in the beginning, it was much higher, I think, because of the lack of PPE or uh, lack of training on the use. It is relatively lower compared to the beginning. I think in, in the beginning, there were countries with uh, healthcare worker infection rate between even 15, 20% of the total cases. Now it is uh, lower than that, but still it is quite significant. Uh, I mean, it is varying in our region also between two to 10% among countries. And uh, it is still an issue. And uh, we are unfortunately hearing uh, infections every day and loss of our colleagues every day in different countries. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, uh, we move to uh, to the second uh, speaker today, and uh, we have you know I am honored to introduce our second speaker in this webinar, our friend and colleague, Dr. Sheikh Badr. And uh, Dr. Sheikh Badr is uh, a health workforce uh, specialist with expertise in health and human resource development in the region and uh, uh, even at the, uh, at the global level. He is the chairperson of the Community Medicine Council of the Arab Board of, uh, for Health Specialties and Policy Development Expert with the National Qualification Authority uh, of the United Arab uh, Emirates. Moreover, he serves as a Secretary General for Sudan Medical Specialization Board. And Dr. Bader was also recently appointed as a member of the WHO Global Expert Advisory Group. So we, as always, we are very proud of uh, Dr. Sheikh. And he today uh, presentation title is Public Health and the Health Workforce, What is Missing? Dr. Sheikh, you, the floor is yours, please, with your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohamed. Uh, for the kind words and uh, thank you, Your uh, Excellency, uh, Dr. Amr, uh, for arranging the uh, webinar and thanks, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, my friend uh, Gulin and, uh, and other presenters. I'm privileged to be with you uh, today. And uh, I will be um, uh, presenting, uh, but before that, I would like to say that Dr. Mohamed, you were strategic in uh, asking uh, Gulin to present Paris. Because now I feel she, uh, her presentation actually has uh, set the stage for, uh, for us, uh, especially my, uh, my presentation, which is going to uh, focus uh, on uh, specifically, I'm sharing my screen. My presentation will, uh, will focus. I don't uh, want to say it will focus on a negative side, but with full appreciation for uh, uh, the successes in our region, uh, I'm specifically in this webinar uh, focusing on what is missing in terms of uh, public health and the health workforce uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And my presentation, uh, I, 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 I hope you are seeing my screen. Yes, we do. Okay, so my presentation will uh, briefly discuss the current situation, challenges, and then we'll provide some uh, few recommendations. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, uh, the health workforce are fundamental for health systems, and they are key in realizing universal health coverage and the sustainable development goals. And the, um, the pandemic has... Uh, uh, even more highlighted the importance of, of the health workforce. So the COVID-19 test has shown us how health workforce are really important and critical. That has been uh, uh, widely uh, uh, publicized. Uh, the, um, probably in health workforce arena, there are some definitional issues. Uh, and, and, and the definitions are variable, actually. Uh, so when you think of health workforce, they could be broad, they could be broader than, than the health care providers. Uh, and then uh, we have in the literature uh, what I can call a narrow focus on three main professions. Usually in the literature, you will find the statistics and numbers on medical doctors, nurses, and midwives. Of course, these three professions are fundamental for healthcare, but equally important, there are other professions in the healthcare arena that uh, actually of uh, very useful role. Uh, also, we have the health workforce, there's us, the public health workforce. This is again uh, a, a bit of a confusion in, in, in definition because in, in my opinion, the, to the totality of the health workforce are actually public health workforce. But we can talk also about core public health workforce. And by that, I mean people who specialize in public health as a discipline uh, uh, and as a specialty for them. So we have 
these definitional issues to set the stage for my presentation. And in addition to that, um, I also, uh, uh, I will present based on this uh, conceptual framework in looking at the public health workforce capacity in terms of four uh, main domains, the education domain, the practice domain, the research uh, area and networking uh, domain. So, um, and uh, I'm talking about the, um, the challenges mainly in terms of our situation. So starting with public health education, um, public health in our region is undermined in medical curricula. And we all know that medical curricula are uh, mainly clinically oriented and the public health content is really uh, very few and, and sometimes neglected in many settings. There is as well lack of a regional competency framework to guide curricula in public health. And when you, when you look into public health curricula for different cadres, uh, you, uh, you would sense that there are some limitations with the technical skills, with the social and political skills, which are integral to public health uh, approach. Uh, the, the generic qualities or personal qualities like leadership, analytical thinking, system thinking, these are very important for public health and they are missing uh, widely in our, in our curriculum. In education also we have the challenge of, uh, of the image of public health versus clinical specialties. We know that there is a preference to clinical uh, disciplines when compared to public health. Also we have the issue of academic or professional. And there is a cynical uh, observation here. While the clinical disciplines in, in clinical medicine are now uh, reorienting heavily towards professional training, public health remains academic largely in terms of uh, uh, providing class-based master degrees or, or even PhDs in public health, which are really important. But uh, my point here is the need for a professional orientation of public health uh, education. Uh, in terms of diversity of applicants, also public health in the region would need to see more of a mix of people coming from different backgrounds to join classes in public health, which is not the case in the region. Also, when we look at the continuing professional development, we, we could also feel uh, uh, a problem in this area where the CPD is largely developed in clinical disciplines when we compare with public health uh, discipline. And there are also issues of quality and, and, and accreditation. And just to give you a striking example, I have looked into data in the Arab world for health specialization. Uh, and, and the Arab world is uh, the major uh, postgraduate uh, health profession education in our region. It graduated uh, more than 20,000 graduates, uh, medical specialists and health specialists. Uh, I looked into 2018 data, a cross-sectional data, and I found that, as you, as you see in this figure, 83% of uh, graduates were for, from clinical specialties, compared to 15% family medicine and only 2% community medicine. And community medicine deals with public health issues and leadership. So the skill mix uh, uh, imbalance is huge in our educational pipeline, and this is just an example. Uh, in, when we come to public health practice, um, uh, we know in our region and in the healthcare settings that public health practice is a second class. Uh, it's class classified after the clinical disciplines. When you practice as a clinician, a specialist, or sub-specialist in, in, in a tertiary hospital setting, that's the most prestigious. But when you are a field epidemiologist, this is seen largely as second class uh, practice, unfortunately. Lack of guidelines and protocols is observed in public health. While in clinical medicine, there are a lot of uh, protocols that guide practice. There is also poor career trajectories and, uh, and the career prospects for public health professions are not clear, providing a negative signal to people who join the educational pipeline. Also, we, we observe dichotomized practice and, uh, and the lack of adequate response to uh, 
its specific public health needs like emergency preparedness and, and response. When we come to the research domain, in public health, uh, research, high quality research is largely lacking in the region because there are issues relating to human capacity, issues relating to funding of research, and in particular, health system research, methodological challenges in terms of, in particular, qualitative research. While most of our public health professionals come from a medical background, public health itself appeal to qualitative methods coming from social sciences. And there is a problem in this area. Publication and dissemination is also a limitation in the region and getting research into evidence and influencing policy and decision making is also a problem in the, in the, in the region. The, the, the last uh, domain of the framework is the public health networking, the associations. And despite the rising uh, potential in our region, we still don't see proper national public health associations. And I, I also checked the website of the World Federation for Public Health Associations, and I found that only five countries from the Eastern Mediterranean or Arab region uh, who are having full-fledged national public health associations. And we have the regional networking is lacking. We have an Arab public health association, which is still in its infancy and recently constituted. Public health events at regional space are inadequate, apart from the efforts exerted by WHO and some few other uh, entities. There is no regional, to, up to my knowledge, no re regional database or repositories on public health uh, experts. Therefore, the challenge, the challenge uh, could be summarized in a triad of quantity, quality, and relevance. We have, as uh, Golin pointed out, we have uh, shortages in the health workforce, we have quality issues in particular in terms of public health training, and we have relevance. When I talked about academic training versus professional training, this is an issue at the heart of public health uh, uh, relevance. On top of that, COVID-19 has exposed the health workforce shortages. It also exposes the lack of um, adequate public health competence of the health workforce. And this has been clear during the pandemic. And it also shown us the lack of a critical mass of core public health workforce. I mean, epidemiologists, people who work in the field, they are in jeopardy, actually. And, and it shows us the pandemic also the weak health promotion capabilities of our health workforce. And hence we are seeing now what, what is called the info, infodemic, which is the erroneous news and, uh, and, uh, and beliefs uh, on the social media. And I'm sure you all know that this is now infiltrating everywhere. And the, and the lesson on, on the vaccines is not only uh, one, but other, other, other issues where we have a lot of misunderstanding in social media. Uh, we also have the low health workforce resilience, which has been shown by the COVID-19. And, and as Dr. Gwyn pointed out, the psychosocial dimensions of the health workforce and the implication of the pandemic. Uh, and, and that all point to the low investment in the health workforce uh, uh, that we are seeing maybe globally, but particularly in, in our region. If there are some suggestions or recommendations, I think broadly speaking for public health education, we need to think uh, uh, of, of uh, revitalizing the curricula in terms of developing a, a regional competency framework that can guide curricula, uh, being more inclined to professional degrees rather than academic degrees. And I think there are important initiative in this area coming up with a new academy on public health, which is being established based on professional basis. And I think it is a promising project. Also, we need to revitalize CPD models for public health professionals and also accreditation in this uh, context. In terms of the practice, we need to uh, uh, turn an eye to protocols and guidelines on public health, which are really very few. And we need also to redesign career pathways to attract our young generation to public health disciplines. And also we need to emphasize uh, teams and interprofessional uh, practice. In terms of the uh, public health research capacity, uh, 
uh, is needed in particular in terms of methodologies, agenda and priority setting, innovative funding for research and publications. And, and by that, I mean also enhancing public health journals in the region, which is, is, is a lacking dimension. In terms of the last one, which is the public health networking, this is uh, really weak in the region. Uh, we need to promote national public health associations. We need to develop regional networks uh, further, and, and Infinite is one of them, which is actually very effective, but we need uh, to scale up these regional initiatives and also linking up to global uh, platforms, such as the World Federation for Public Health Association. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sheikh Badr. This is this was very very informative uh, presentation, and just you know one burning question: How can lessons, yani, how can lessons learned from COVID nineteen pandemic be reflected, utilized for long term health, uh, human resources strategies toward more resilience in systems? How we can use this momentum? Yes, please. I think uh, this is a, this is a very strategic question, and and it is a broad question, which needs actually mobilization of capacity in different uh, direction. But uh, I think if COVID nineteen uh, has provided uh, a useful uh, or some useful lessons, this is one of them in terms of directing our attention to the importance of uh, promoting public health workforce. We discovered now we have. Uh, uh, an imbalance, which is huge, actually. We are more tended to curative medicine, to clinical disciplines, and we do neglect public health. Therefore, we have only few public health professionals, and I think countries would need to learn the lesson from this, and regional and global organizations would need to promote the direction towards uh, uh, creating a new generation of competent public health uh, professionals. Thank you, thank you. Just, you know, I have one more quick question about, you know, public-private dialogue, where we are, what strategies would be recommended for policymakers for enhancing public-private dialogue in the context of strengthening public health workforce investment based on COVID-19? This is, in my opinion, a very challenging area, Dr. Mohanad, yeah. because as we know in our region, uh, yeah, public health, uh, uh, private sector actually uh, doesn't invest a lot in public health. Mm -hmm. And the, the private sector is inclined more toward, uh, towards the clinical and specialized uh, medicine and all these things. So in terms, and, and that, that's why the role of the state in public health is actually fundamental to, to provide the leadership, provide the framework to uh, encourage more and to incentivize the private sector to then to, to do health into the area of uh, uh, public health, uh, whether public health education, public health practice. And I think this, this needs a reorientation in our health systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will continue, you know, we will have more time for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sheikh Badr. It was very informative presentation. I appreciate it. So then we can move uh, uh, our third to our third uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Julian Goodman, Director of Agency of uh, for Public Health Education Accreditation, AFIA. Uh, as known, you know, AFIA is the, a global accreditation agency focused on quality assurance and uh, improvement uh, of public health education and tra training. And Dr. Goodman, uh, will present us, uh, you know, a presentation about COVID-19 changes in curricular context and approaches. Uh, Dr. Uh, Goodman, the floor is yours, please, to present your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. I just um, want to bring you on to the presentation then. Oh, I've got, got the wrong one. Anyway, um, I'll continue with this one. So here I just want to really have a look at some of the issues that we've found with regard to um, the changes in education research and service with um, COVID-19. 
And um, I think Mahan is, is quite sufficiently pointed out what we do. We're a global accreditation agency where we focus on education and training <clears throat> of public health, um, both institutionally, program wise, and also at course level, uh, CPD level. So, um, what I want to have a look at really is, is just to consider two root challenges that we're seeing within our systems. Um, one is, of course, um, the forced physical closures, the lockdowns that we're seeing and how that's affecting education. But also, I want to then just cast a little shadow over the, um, the frontline nature of what we do very differently to other disciplines, such as law or engineering. We're very much frontline uh, with COVID-19, which has an impact on, on our sector. So moving on, uh, so the, the lockdowns, they um, basically, it's access to learning resources for everybody involved, for the students and faculty. Uh, and what we've seen there is some strategies that have included uh, more electronic based uh, access. We'll come on to um, the face-to-face -face teaching, but with regard to library resources, we're seeing that, you know, generally, you know, the majority of, of uh, material is electronically available anyway. Um, and some of the some of the schools and universities have been able to offer other services through their libraries, such as getting hold of books, etc. But they're very much a firefighting um, exercise. And we don't have the data yet to say what's happening across uh, major regions of the world to see how, how to align that data. The other issue then really for us is, is what sort of um, pastoral care is taking place for the students and other areas such as uh, personal tutoring and career uh, tutoring. Uh, we're, we're seeing that some of those are going online, but it's still in a sense, we're not getting an idea of how that's affecting the student body and, and how they're appreciating it or not. And then um, the big area really then is, is the same as all of us. We've had to make a, an adjustment to online. And what we see there is that, um, you know, for schools that are teaching international uh, students, for example, if you're in America and you're teaching a lot of Chinese students, you've got relatively big issues going on and you're gonna have to make a, a, a big, step other ones have um other schools and programs so they, what we've seen is that the older the person is this sounds rather ageist that the older the person is or uh, the the lack of experience they have with uh, electronics and with computers often causes a few issues so um that that is an issue and, and one of the one of the areas we've seen around that is to ensure that they're fully supported and that the ones that we're seeing are being able to adapt the quickest and the best are the ones which have that online support and that pedagogic support. What we're also seeing is a lot of blended approaches as well and these have been coming up anyway and I think most academic units have been sort of dabbling in blended approaches or hybrid approaches, as was mentioned earlier, but we, we tend to call it blended where you've got a mix of um, live and um, recorded sessions. So uh, the other aspect is that what we're seeing is that a lot of lecturers are really being asked just to convert their lectures to an online format. And we spoke earlier about um, America and China, we've even come across cases where the lecturer is actually having to wake up in the middle of the night to, to service a, a class full of students in, in China. And one of the issues there, of course, is that online learning is actually a, a developing area of expertise itself. And one of the um, underlying support systems for that is what we call asynchronous learning, uh, recorded lectures and materials. And that helps the student uh, back it up. So that that has to be considered uh, but of course as I mentioned before a lot of people are firefighting at the moment so then we've also got with with regard to uh, electronic uh, learning types of distance learning online is that we have issues with, with, with what's called electronic propinquity which is uh, stands for the electronic closeness that you can get through the computer screen and also with equity the bandwidths and time zones as we spoke about China but 
uh, say, for example, bandwidths in certain areas of the world are very difficult. And that, that creates a, a, a stress on synchronous levels of training. So then moving on to the next area, which is really very much uh, sector specific, what we have is uh, that a lot of our faculty and students that we're, we're meeting with are frontline actors. They're, they're involved in the primary healthcare, they're involved in national strategies. And that puts major pressure on me, both within our organization, but as the sector as a whole, it's a massive pressure. And what we've seen there is um, an adoption of more flexibility within the systems. And that is sometimes more difficult, to, more difficult with regard to any uh, rigid systems. When you have, especially the older universities, which are very rigid, it can create issues there. But most have been um, flexible with this. Um, and then also what we've seen is that um, we've seen COVID because we put it um, sort of center stage within our system. So we were asking people really about the format of, of the training, how you're approaching it, also the content. And what we were seeing was that obviously we, we were seeing integration within epidemiology and biostats, which you would imagine, but also within health promotion health systems and really that flow throughout the standardized curriculum of a public health program. Um, and then we also saw uh, the research being integrated and, uh, and very innovative ways of, of um, adapting research from other areas on mass testing, logistics, for example, and, and vaccine distribution. And then also we, we saw some community outreach uh, examples with, for example, rapid review of uh, national responses being uh, used with the students and then fed back immediately into the national uh, public health uh, strategies. So um, <clears throat> really looking at the longer term picture and the long haul, I've called it here, uh, electronic uh, training has been pushed to the forefront. That's without anybody's uh, doubt. Uh, I think that for my part, I think what we should take care to ensure a balance um, because converting completely over to electronic uh, training and learning is, is ha does also carry risks. Um, we see the major um, benefits and um, successes when training is being supported and so without a doubt that is an absolute recommendation support both pedagogically and technologically uh, any online training uh, asynchronous training we mentioned and that has to be supported and really taken on seriously i think that that, that brings us on to the ability of online um, training to really get into areas and can often be remote areas. We see it in, say, for example, in uh, Australia, where the actual geographic region is, is, is very, uh, not defined, but very unique, shall we say. And they're able to get their education to very hard to get to areas through blended approach, uh, through blended approaches. And I think also that, that increases uh, equity of international education and education in general. Uh, and it means that the education can go directly into the workforce rather than people having to travel and then taking up courses which may last a year or two and then only being able to implement their training when they return. So then um, <clears throat> the other side is, is really, and, and on the last uh, one we had this about the uh, networks as well, is the, the, the real care that we need to take to create communities and to ensure that the students are both academically and pastoral, um, pastorally looked after and we must bear in mind in that re regard that online learning does have um, high dropout rates, um, which are a lot higher than we would find on campus-based learning. Okay, so <clears throat> finally then, just to wrap up, uh, just some personal reflections, and I hope I'm not gonna be too uh, negative, but hopefully some positive comments in here. Um, you know, like anything, I think that we have, we're having to adapt. Um, and, you know, basic Darwinisms, you know, adapt or die is, is basically coming into play. Um, I think that electronic learning is absolutely here to stay. Um, and also we shouldn't see this as being a, a, a product of uh, the zeitgeist of what's happening now, but we, we've seen uh, electronics and, and formats change. We used to have the chalkboard, we had overhead projectors and then computers. And th this is really, um, basically you're seeing a lot of younger people come in that are using these tools. So we should uh, look to embrace that anyway. Um, 
but we have to be aware of the risks that are involved, uh, such as malware viruses we've seen in, in many health systems, in fact, and electronic out outages, et cetera. Um, there is a concern for the mobility and the internationalization of students over the short term. We're seeing a, 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 a very sort of uh, a damning, uh, as we might say, of, of students traveling. And that will cause some quite um, distinct financial disturbances to many schools that rely on uh, international students. Um, but, the, you know, looking at um, some of the other aspects with regard to the skills, we spoke about skills and, and, and the, the skills not lining up. And, and I agree. I, I think that for a long time, it's been a concern that we're, we're not teaching enough uh, infectious disease control um, in and communicable disease control in, in more Western countries. But that, in a sense, is a product of the priorities of the, the national burdens of disease, where a lot of countries have had NCD issues. So they focus on the NCD issues. And I would say that, you know, we can reverse that situation. And so well, a lot of countries are actually having NCD problems and they're only really focusing on uh, communicable disease. And the same goes for zoonotic disease, etc. So I think that, you know, I'm going to be fair to, to some of these regions, but it, it, it's certainly a, a, a kick in, into the system. And then also, again, uh, with regard to the other skills that we may need to uh, focus on as well, such as media messaging and managing information, we mentioned that before, and that's, that's going to be a, a real key one, especially as these are electronic. And then I just want to be sort of just add my positive personal reflection on this. And I think, that, first of all, I think when we talk about workforce, we've, we've been saying for many years now that we've got a problem with workforce. And one of the problems with that is attracting workforce. One of the problems with that is that they don't even know what public health is, or we, we find it very difficult to explain to people what public health is. And so it, it, it lacks a momentum. And I just recently came across this uh, series on, on Netflix. And just for the sake that we're having public health films and miniseries now on Netflix tells us something. But here's a, here's a particular person, uh, Sira Madad, uh, who, who watched a film, uh, Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, and then um, said, right, that's it, I know what my vocation is. And I think that what we'll find, um, I hope, in the future is that because uh, public health has become so salient and to the forefront, we will start to see a lot more people uh, come forward I, this is a sincere hope because it's promoting public health, which I've not really seen that much in the past. And on top of that, I think that, you know, this is really for us. I mean, one thing I notice is I don't need to explain to people what public health is anymore. Um, and that is a, a, a real positive. Okay, so that's, that's it. Uh, I'll just stop sharing. I hope that's okay with everyone and any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so just, you know, one question uh, It's about what are some of the successes or lessons learned from the shift to online training as a result of the lockdown that would have impact the future of the education programs in public health? Mm. <clears throat> well, for me, I think that it's about connectivity with people. I think that when you start to go into online training and a lot of people have been forced into it there's been a real sort of reticence especially in the older generations to accept this kind of training and there's been a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a struggle going on like we see with clinical and, and, and non-clinical uh, public health and i think this has changed that and i think now we're looking more towards adaptation to online and seeing the strengths of that but i don't want the fulcrum in my view i don't want the fulcrum to go all the other way either there are benefits in traditional methods and, and closeness and community and network that we, we, we can't let go of, but certainly for being uh, backed up. And I mean, if you have a look at uh, MOOCs, massive online courses, the ability to get mass uh, education and training out there is now at a level unseen. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive about it, although this comes out of a very dire situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, so uh, uh, our last but not least speaker today is our Professor uh, Scott McNabb. So we are very happy to have uh, Professor Scott McNabb with us and uh, 
Scott now is currently a research professor at Emory University, uh, uh, Roland's, uh, uh, Roland's School of Public Health, and the director of King Abdullah Fellowship Program. He is also managing Barter Public Health Practice. Before retirement from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at CDC Atlanta, Dr. Scott McNabb was Associate Director of, for Science, Public Health Informatics and Technology Program Office, Office of, for Surveillance, Epidemiology and Lab Services. From 2006 to 2008, he directed the Division of Integrated Surveillance System and Services National Center for Public Health Informatics at CDC. So Dr. Scott's presentation is titled Modernizing Global Health Security Through Healthcare and Public Health Workforce Development. Dr. Scott, the floor is yours, please. Assalamu alaikum, Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum. I, I, good I, I assume you can you can see my screen okay? Everything's okay? Yes. Yes. Good, can. good. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting me and I'd like to honor those of you that are working on the front lines during this pandemic. Uh, you really are the heroes of our current culture, and I acknowledge the sacrifice and the selflessness that you've offered. I'd also like to thank my colleagues who I've been working with, uh, Afan Sheikh, of course, but I think uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Gada Farhat is on the call, as well as my colleagues at the Africa CDC, as I will show you. So I think we are, uh, you've mentioned all this, has been, this has been a wonderful presentation. Uh, and I, I, I see the pandemic as revealing to us the gaps, if you will, in the public health fabric. Certainly there are so many terrible events, the deaths and the sickness and so forth. But at the same time, it's a challenge for us as public health officials to find out what went wrong. How can we repair the gaps in public health so this does not happen again? It's really important for us to be able to do that. So I'd like to talk first of all about uh, the fact is that scaling essential health interventions to achieve health development targets is constrained by a lack of skilled health professionals to deliver these services. This has been pointed out in the prior, prior presentations. It's a very important gap that we have right now. It's something that we need to work to try to prevent. And I think that if this statement, uh, for those left behind, the spectacular advances in health worldwide are really an indictment of our collective failure to ensure the equitable sharing of health progress. And this happens in many different levels, uh, not, not the least of which is access to information. So our question that we're posing uh, today is, how can we allow working professionals the chance to improve themselves? How can we address the inequities of access to information? Those are the challenges of our day. Uh, and I think it's been pointed out by the experts earlier that by the year 2030, there'll be uh, 15 million person shortage of health professionals uh, in the global community. Uh, that's just in the next 10 years. So we have, we have identifying the gap, <laughs> identifying what needs to be done. And I, I'm going to present some uh, challenging ideas that I think are appropriate. They've been hinted at and described in the earlier presentations as well. Uh, that traditional approaches to addressing human resource constraints usually focused on reactive needs-based planning. And the reality is that educational institutions, including mine at Emory University in Atlanta, which is a private university, uh, were intentionally modeled on factories to standardize teaching and testing. And so we would go into the classroom, the, the students would come into the classroom face-to-face, -face, and we would, we would enter into this dialogue. Um, and I'm going to make a case that that is uh, changing. Uh, we're moving into a different era. And I, I would like to say that uh, the technology may be changing, but the classroom and teaching methods really are pretty much unchanged for the last hundred years. It was pointed out earlier that this pandemic has created a crisis in the, uh, in the, way, we, in the way we work today. And it creates a whole new environment where we need to be thinking about new ways of doing a uh, business. So the reality is that most universities have offered online courses, but they've not really disrupted anything. In fact, in my university, the online training program was very, very primitive. Um, and it's, it's uh, challenged the faculty and the administrators to really think about this in a new way. It simply used to uh, sustain what they did and continue with the same sort of lecture room model. And so the truth is that 
traditional models leave students like Swiss cheese left with holes in their learning, I would argue, so that each person has a has a unique role and responsibility uh, in education. I mean, think about um, what's happening now. I, I see this as a really an opportunity for us to um, work toward a new model of both in-service training, which is training those persons that are already in the workforce, as well as pre-service training. How do we work together university to university to work in a collaborative environment? Uh, we work quite with many universities in Saudi Arabia, for example, and also in Africa to sort of establish the relationships. I think we're moving to a new model where the universities work together um, in, at a way. Um, this, this basically uh, means that there's a, a model of innovation uh, that was uh, put together by Harvard faculty member Christensen, which talks about disruptive technology, where uh, technology transforms products and services to make them more affordable and accessible. And you can imagine uh, the difference between personal computers and mainframe computers, how personal computers have completely disrupted innovation, how cell phones and fixed line telephones. I mean, my mother is 93 years old and she has an iPhone 10. And that's a credit to Steve Jobs in, in many ways because he kept his engineering team in the background until they could produce something that was so easy, you plug it in, turn it on, and you use it. That's a, one of the key issues. And I believe that e-learning is also in this uh, model of disruptive technology. Now, for those of you that have been working in this field, you know that when something comes up at first, uh, those in the inner circle will look at it and say, why would I want that? Uh, and in many ways, uh, many university uh, uh, administrators were challenging uh, online training because why would I want that? In fact, we I presented these ideas to many people and they say, who would want to do an online course? But we're moving into a new era. Uh, disruption spreads out to make things more affordable, convenient. It blesses the lives of those who previously never could have had access to it. And then when the quality is right and the price is dropped, those in the inner circle rush to get in. <laughs> but sometimes it's too late. So that's why uh, innovative thinking Courage, the uh, trial and error uh, of trying to do this right becomes very important. If we look at e-learning, this is learning conducted via electronic media, typically on the internet as a definition. And we think of the drivers for e-learning. We're talking about the rise in demand for cost-effective training and learning techniques, both in the corporate and academic sectors, the shift toward flexible electronic solutions, increased effectiveness of automated learning, increased internet uh, penetration and the surge in the number of smartphones with mobile learning technology, micro learning for specialized training, increased emphasis on online content development and blended learning, and a growing interest in what's called flipped classroom and adaptive learning, plus increased government participation as the government agencies come on board and realize this is a much more effective and efficient means of delivering uh, content. Um, I'd like to give a metaphor here, and I, I gave a talk at Emory a year and a half ago, which basically was we're moving from what we call Blockbuster to Netflix. Blockbuster was uh, an old school before before uh, uh, the Netflix era, as it were, where you would go into the store, physically drive, maybe rent a DVD, watch it there, or bring the DVD home and watch it at your home. Um, and if you came of age in the 1980s, you spent a few Friday nights at your local Blockbuster browsing the new release shelves and maybe rating the return bin for the hottest titles. It was looking for the best movies. But at its peak, Blockbuster had almost 10,000 stores worldwide. Um, and as time moved on, the, uh, the uh, hang on for just a second here, as time moved on, oops, forgive me. <laughs> Let me go back real quickly. That's a part of the technology uh, issues here. As time moved on, uh, Blockbuster lost its its uh, ability and became bankrupt. And actually, over time, Netflix began in 1997. It had nowhere near the marketplace strength of Blockbuster, which rented DVDs. Uh, but by the year 2000, Blockbuster began to lose revenue. Netflix wasn't doing all that well either. The Netflix CEO approached Blockbuster uh, with the attempt to try to sell it. And he was actually laughed out of the meeting. But by 2007, 
Netflix went on and expanded its business with the introduction of a streaming service. And then by 2010, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. And in 2019, the Netflix uh, capitalization was over 152 billion. I'm sure it's much more now. So this is a, a message, I think, that we're moving into a new era, which our previous presenters have discussed as well. But I would like to say that we have to move into this new era thoughtfully with the concepts of instructional design, the concepts of um, uh, that each individual trainee or each individual participant has his or her own needs. There are characteristics that are shared by these digital disruptors. Oops. And one of those is customer obsession, meaning we start with the customer and work backward. As I mentioned, my mother is a good example. What are her needs? How can she function? How would she use an iPhone? And we start with that customer. We, we talk about exceptional service design, creating a service that requires minimum steps to complete making it human friendly, uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration, uh, fairly flat organizational structure. That's why we want to work in our, in our sense, uh, a university to university to meet the needs of students. And also a focus on what I will call love matrix, which means that the matrix are, we're focused on the customer. We have a very assertive monitoring and evaluation approach where we're getting feedback and making sure we adjust to meet the customer's needs. And you look at other digital disruptors, those are all common now. We see how Amazon and Uber, and all the other uh, companies that have met the needs. So we, we began a collaboration, uh, fortunately, working as a, to serve and support the Africa CDC to establish what's called the Institute for Workforce Development. I would like to acknowledge my Africa CDC colleagues who may be on this call as well. And in the uh, 2019, before the pandemic, the main goal of the Institute for Workforce Development was to achieve Africa CDC's workforce development mission to increase the quality and quantity of African professionals in epidemiology, laboratory and public health informatics, those areas. And it was, it's was it been a very, very um, successful effort working with our team there. Um, and we in 2019, we hosted four courses. Uh, the timeline of these courses, the first course was Transforming Public Health Surveillance, which was offered in the summer of 2019. We had 103 epidemiologists from all over the continent, many of them working and the Ebola crisis, and was, we have all the monitoring and evaluation reports to share with you the success of this. We use Canvas as the learning management system, which we believe is the very best. Um, we also hosted a course on antimicrobial resistance and proposal writing, and I'll share that with you in just a moment. Dr. Farhat was the lead instructor, and also leadership and management. The target audience for the Africa CDC are the National Public Health Institutes in Africa. So the uh, leaders were directors of the MPHI. So these four courses were offered uh, in a way that, that was, uh, for example, this is the proposal writing course metrics, 209 applicants, 39 were enrolled. So there was a representativeness uh, among the continent, 20 countries represented. This was a course designed to teach people how to write a research, a, a grant proposal so they could get funding for their program, included the introduction, searching for ideas and funding sources, getting started, de developing the narrative, submitting your methods, working on the proposal. And that was in concert with our faculty. So the 29, 39 people enrolled would work on their projects and then work directly with a faculty member to improve them as they move forward. And then finally have a proposal ready to submit. Uh, we host a research skills development course also, which teaches mainly medical faculty. We've worked with uh, several universities in Saudi Arabia who have come to Emory in the past physically to develop research skills, meaning these senior medical students or faculty would think about a research question uh, and then start developing a research proposal that they would uh, hope would be funded in the long run. We've taught our Transforming Public Health Surveillance course online at Emory. I'm teaching it online now at the University of Georgia and also at uh, Columbia University in New York. We teach successful scientific writing, effective oral communication. You know, professionals in our field not only have to be able to communicate uh, on, and, and publish their uh, findings, but also to be able to communicate to the media, uh, to, a, to a meeting, for example, do a poster presentation or whatever that may be. So these are the types of, of uh, courses that we teach. We use Canvas, again, 
which on the back end of Canvas has the ability for us to track the learning objectives. So the participant, we can measure the, the performance. I'm sorry? Running late, you know. We, we, OK. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm just about finished. Yeah. We have now a collaboration with uh, with the uh, Pakistan National Institute of Health working uh, to develop this type of uh, training activity. So let me it's finish up here. And I think that the, the last thing I would say is that the areas of the future to scale impact, looking at linkages to ensure sustainable growth, meaning local experts uh, do are, are, are a key stakeholder, adapt to changing needs, et cetera, with the idea of flipped classrooms, using new tools uh, to be able to do this learning. And the future vision would be to implement the research skills course and proposal writing course for international stakeholder with a robust uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, I think we have very limited time. Uh, thus, we will open the floor for uh, questions from the audience, maybe a couple of questions. So. So just, you know, about how we can, uh, to Scott, uh, uh, how we can the bridge the gap between academia and, you know, and uh, uh, between suppliers and demand, you know, using the, uh, the technology, online technology. So how, how this gap, we used to see this gap. So can we use the online uh, technique, you know, to bridge this gap, please? Yes, certainly. You know, we proposed what we call FETP Plus, which is actually the idea of using um, video recording at a high level, uh, these core lectures that are given to public health professionals who are in the field epi training program, and they can listen to the recorded lectures the night before, then they come to the class face to face. It's called blended learning it was mentioned earlier. These are techniques which are really in, enhance uh, the capacity, uh, make uh, uh, on uh, face to face training better, really. Um, and I think also, you know, our idea of working university to university. Uh, we're very interested in collaborating with universities and have established those relationships in some universities in Saudi Arabia where we where we co-teach um, online and the students from each of uh, the universities take the course and we actually, you know, uh, work together, if you will, based on uh, strong pedagogy, which was mentioned. We look at competencies that should be that should be gained. We look at the learning objectives. We develop the content in a very strong way. But then I would say the back end of this is also very, very important. For a lecturer to give a, a 45 minute lecture may, may take them 20 hours to prepare, put together the PowerPoint slides or whatever, but then it may take 80 hours in the back end to do the video, video recording and also cropping because the attention span of people is very small. So if you do an hour lecture, you may be cropping it into two to three minute sound bites and then creating the stream of education thank you, um, thank you dr scott thank you so uh, uh, uh the question and the question we will back to dr giddick so question uh what strategies what who recommend for policy makers for enhancing public private partnership or dialogue in terms of the context of strengthening public health workforce investment based on COVID-19. So uh, any plan to, to, to do private public health uh, uh, dialogue or how we can use this momentum? Is this a question for me? No, it's for uh, okay. Dr. Giddick, if WHO colleague. Yes, please. Thank you for this question. I think uh, this is an area which we are really working on that, not only on public health workforce, not only on health workforce, but in general, uh, because the share of private sector in the region in, health, uh, in service delivery is, and education is increasing. Therefore, it is becoming an important resource to tap in. And, uh, in the region, we are really working on the issue, how we can tap in this resource better to improve the health, of, health outcomes. And when it comes to health workforce, and we have uh, regional frameworks for uh, public-private partnership, and which was adopted by the regional committee two years ago, and we are promoting that. And uh, we are working with in the countries, 
having policy, facilitating policy dialogues between public and private sector and incorporating all stakeholders. And when it comes to health workforce, I think private sector is important, both in education and also in employment. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are several aspects we need to be very, very careful. If we are having so much share of the private sector, it is important how do we ensure the quality. So regulatory frameworks, regulation of health workforce in terms of both practice and education is critical in our region. And there are in many of the countries, regulation, health workforce regulations still needs to be, has the room to be improved and updated to the requirements of that new, new needs. And of course, uh, considering public health education and employment of public health workforce is important. Second aspect, uh, I think, uh, in the region, there is more attention paid to health labor market. It is a labor market issue, and there is a close link between education market and the labor market. So I think the demand should come from labor. Education market works for the demand for the education, and that's very much linked for the demand in the uh, labor market. I think we need, countries are uh, paying more attention for labor market analysis. And I think we should uh, really uh, invest in that so that this can provide input to the dialogue between two sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Goni. Thank you. So move to Dr. Sheikh. So how do you see the future of the government role of the global initiatives and bodies in managing pandemics? So. So how do you see the governing? I think that, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good and, and, and difficult question at yeah. one time. And I think uh, despite the, the recognition of the important uh, uh, partners uh, who have a stake in the health arena, like public, private, uh, NGOs and others, but the, the fact remains that the government should uh, demonstrate leadership. Leadership and facilitation should come from the side of government. That's why um, I think at the apex of the health system, governments uh, represented by ministries of health and, and health system leadership should be promoting and facilitating dialogue among different partners, including the private sector and, and others. And, 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 and the um, the collective movement of stakeholders is actually fundamental for success. It needs to be nurtured and it needs to be initiated and supported by governmental leadership. So it is a public health or a public sector responsibility at the end of the day. Thank you. And by the way, this is not my question. This is from one of the audience. So this is a good question. So uh, Dr. Julian, what are the missing competencies in public health workforce revealed by the pandemic? How, how, how do you see the missing competencies? I think that comes back to the stakeholder issue, doesn't it? The, how do you uh, create competencies for your workforce? And I think that has to be made by the stakeholder community. It wouldn't be for an organization like ours to say, this is what you should do because it has to reflect and everybody has their own community they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I'm avoiding that one, uh, Mahana. I, I think I did a quite good job with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a uh, few minutes left. So uh, really, I uh, thank you all. And uh, it was really very, very, very good discussion. And uh, uh, it's very good things that we shared with the region this evening. So uh, if you allow me just to, uh, to highlight that, uh, I like what uh, Dr. Gooden start, uh, started with, that we need to do more such uh, webinars, meeting, conversation, dialogue, and other things. And we are very proud you know, to take this initiative for the future. And I hope, you know, in your collaboration, we can do more 
such successful webinars in the future where we focus mainly on the workforce uh, in the region and in the globe. Uh, I think, you know, uh, with all uh, headache and with all painful momentum with the COVID-19, but we maybe could bring public health to the top of our uh, uh, government's agenda. And I hope we need to capitalize on this momentum and to do more work in terms of, uh, as Dr. Sheikh mentioned that, one of the challenges in the past that we were uh, as a public health sector, you know, we were not very well recognized in the region and I think elsewhere in the globe, but I will mainly focus on the region. So we need to show the case that we are capable and this specialty is very important, you know, to, to secure, to secure, sa save lives in our region. And in, uh, in terms of, uh, yes, I think uh, in, in my country and in the region in general, you know, the online training was questionable for a long time. I think COVID-19 brought the importance and the applicability of the online training and different modalities, et cetera, to, to our uh, to our region. Still yet, we have challenges in the region and elsewhere, but I think, you know, we could, we could see, you know, successful example about such type of, uh, uh, of, uh, of our uh, uh, training. Uh, of course, you know, as, as colleagues mentioned that we had before that, we have many problems related to the workforce and et cetera. We have shortage of staff, we have shortage of infrastructure, etc. But I am sure that if we collectively at the regional, international and country level work together, you know, to empower the workforce development agenda in the future, this will be very, very efficient. So finally, allow me to, to, to uh, give the floor for our Professor Amir Salama, you know, to say, a closing remarks and then you know we can close the webinar thank you professor amir salama please your excellent yes, sure thank you very much dr mohanad thank you for yani, this excellent uh, uh, webinar actually and the management of this uh, webinar in an excellent way and let me uh, yani, extend my thanks to the distinguished speakers once again dr julian uh, dr goodman uh, dr badr and Dr. McNabb for their excellent presentations. And I think it was one of the most useful and excellent webinars which the Association of Arab Universities held uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, for the past uh, year. Uh, thank you all, uh, all the participants for the proactive participation and the rich discussions, which I was following from the chats and from the QA. And I'm looking forward to seeing those recommendations which we reached together uh, to turn into reality. We will continue organizing, inshallah, such webinars and scientific gathering to discuss various topics that concern our region in different fields. Thank you, Infinite, uh, for the, your fruitful cooperation. And thank you all again once more. And see you next webinar, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Have a nice day. Thank you very much.